It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I am your host, private investigator Ed Opperman, and this show is brought to you by PSCoco.com. Uh, you go to PSCoco.com, and uh, you can, that's Phoebe Sod's uh, chocolate website. Uh, Phoebe Sod's an independent curator with the Cocoa Exchange. Uh, TSC is formerly known as Dove Chocolate Discoveries. These are the finest chocolates you can get uh, because they start with the best cocoa beans, which are tested for quality and flavor by expert technicians. The Cocoa Exchange offers not just premium chocolates, but anything from sauces and spices to brownie and cake mixes and even coffee and martini mixes. So if you wish to taste yourself, uh, uh, treat yourself or someone you love to a sweet and tasty gift, then the Cocoa Exchange is the brand for you. So you go to PSCocoa.com, P-S-C-O-C-O-A.com. You click on the Shop Now button. You see the beautiful chocolates. You can order those chocolates right now. They could be in your mailbox by Monday morning. Or if you want to get into the cocoa business like Phoebe Side, you can be a chocolatier as well, get your own website. You hit the Contact Us button, and Phoebe will put you into the cocoa business, the chocolate cocoa business. Also want to uh, welcome our brand new station. We just started on a, on a, a brand new station today, a Pulse Talk Radio uh, 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 over there in the UK. It's our first night on their show, on their station. Uh, so welcome all the UK listeners. I'll try and talk slowly. I know a lot of people think I have a, a New York accent, but I lost that a long time ago. All right. Very excited about our guest today. We have uh, Marina Anderson, uh, the ex-wife of David Carradine. Uh, she's written a book called uh, David Carradine, Eye of the Tornado, and it explores her, her marriage, her love affair with David Carradine and uh, the unfortunate death of David Carradine. And she even got into an investigation of, it, of, his, dirt, uh, of his death and his murder. Oh, now, now, I think at one point she said she suspected it was a murder. I'm not sure what she says about it now. Uh, you could find uh, this book here. It's on Amazon.com as well. Uh, you could find it on Opperman Report, blogspot.com. We'll have it on there. Uh, also the Opperman Report bookstore, but also David Carradine book.com and uh, Marina also has a website called marinaanderson.com because she's a very uh, well uh, versed actress as a matter of fact she got a film coming out just came out in March called uh, The Red Maple Leaf she'll be telling us all about too as well Marina are you there I am here but I gotta tell you you still stay in New York to me <laughs> yeah I know I know I know I know <laughs> It was worse. <laughs> you want to order a hot dog, and I haven't eaten meat in years. <laughs> yeah, I haven't eaten meat either. I'm doing a Daniel okay. fast, uh, 40 days now. Uh, so, Marina, <laughs> tell us about yourself. Tell us about the Marina Anderson. Oh, goodness. The Marina Anderson right today, I, I, I was telling you a little bit about it. I'm kind of like a little – I go on little mini war paths when I see there's injustice in certain areas of the world or what I've experienced and stuff. So, currently um, – outside of what my mother is going through, oh. um, uh, I found that uh, I have mold in my condominium that was uh, caused by a roof leak from the HOA. And I, I connected with this company called Mold USA, and I'm telling you, it was like this major uh, education for me. I'll try and capsulize it for you. Um, if you have any work, it has to be done if it's caused by an HOA homeowners association. You have to get permission. They have to um, do mold testings and things. Well, but I was refused this, so I went ahead and I hired this company, Mold USA, to do my mold testing. And sure enough, it comes back that I had mold. Well, they ignored the suggestion, and, and you know, I would say I, uh, documentation because I also represent. I do publicity. Um, this um, building contractor, Scott Harris, who built Ed Bakley Jr.'s lead platinum green home, by the way, um, and he sent me this email saying you got to get those walls opened up because uh, you could create mold. And and I'm going, wow, okay, well I'll take his advice. He's the expert. I don't know anything about this because I'm a newbie to this whole area. Well, it wasn't done, and I keep pushing because the experts are telling me you've got to open up the walls, you're going to have mold. Fast forward, they didn't, and I do, and I, I've done such major research. Um, Eric Troyer, former member of the orchestra, produced a documentary called Moldy, 
And I watched that, and I was just, my, my, my mouth was to the floor. I was like, oh, my God, this is very serious stuff. People have no idea why they have illnesses, and it could very well be caused by mold that they don't know they have in their walls. Whenever you have a water leak, it can lead to mold. And uh, until they get that checked out, it could be anywhere from cancer to respiratory to, um, you know, confusion. I mean, there's a whole long list of things that uh, allergic reactions and toxic reactions to mold can be. And everybody's kind of heard about the black mold. Well, it's a very serious thing. So I kind of open up that <laughs> uh, whole world to, to um, the public. I'm kind of like blasting it out on Facebook and things. People have to get educated about this because it is a hidden danger. And they say, oh, just, well, there's nothing you can't, there's nothing, no black stuff on the walls. It doesn't matter. It's behind the wall that you can't see. So it's um, very important <laughs> that I'm getting out there. No matter where you live, you could have mold in your walls and not know it. And uh, I thoroughly, highly suggest getting your homes checked. Well, well have so you, you experienced any medical uh, effects, any health uh, ill effects from this uh, mold? Me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I Coughing, hoarse throat, confusion. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I have a long list of things. And, you know, when I get outside, um, you know, mold is everywhere. But under certain conditions, it grows to a point where you don't want it to grow. So um, people who are more sensitive, I'm... Uh, one of my friends and, and another neighbor, they have a high sensitivity to mold, and they got very, very sick. This one woman I met through Facebook, extremely sick. It's taken her five years to detox from the toxicity in her system. So it, 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 the, the levels of, of how it affects people, is it can vary, and um, <clears throat> it, it can lead to very serious things. So uh, it's important to pay attention to this. And doctors ordinarily don't think of, well, maybe we should check to see if you have this in your system or if you're allergic to this and that, that. And there's hundreds of types of mold. So when you get a mold test, they have uh, like a graph and they say what mold they find in the concentrated air in your room. They do what's called an ambient test and then they do a core cavity sample of what's in the wall and they, they have it documented in what they give to you in their reports what they find and to the levels. And um, it's pretty scary. It can be pretty scary. Why so, don't you give the audience yeah. a little an idea of your background in a, as an actress in the, in the movie industry? Uh, well, um, I um, I have relatives in the business. Uh, my granduncle Harry Joe Brown produced the Randolph Scott westerns, and uh, one of my cousins on my dad's side of the family as well is Ray Evans, the uh, four Oscar winning uh, lyricist. Ray um, uh, wrote the lyrics to Casera Sera, Buttons oh. and Bows, Silver Bells, um, the Bonanza theme, Mr. Ed theme. Um, his partner Jay Livingston uh, wrote for years and years and years together. So. Growing up with that kind of element to the family, my mother was a contract singer to Warner Brothers. My dad was a, uh, a musician as well, but he segued into aerospace. My mom wanted the family, so she, you know, raised the family. <clears throat> and um, I just, you know, ever since I was four years old, I remember being on stage with my mom because she was singing, because she continued her singing. And I was like, oh, I want to do that. I, wanna, I want that. I want that. People smiling at me and applauding. That's, this is nice. So when I got older, um, I just kept pursuing it and pursuing it with not much help from my family because they didn't really want that from me. Um, and um, I eventually, uh, you know, got professional at it. Um, in fact, that's kind of how I met David in the 70s um, when I was taking acting lessons on the Warner Brothers lot. And that was one of the reasons why we actually got married on the Warner Brothers lot on Laramie Street, to be exact, is because it's where we originally met. Um, so, uh, so fast forward, uh, you know, lots of national commercials, guest starring, starring reoccurring roles and TV shows and a lot of film. Um, so if you, you know, Google Marina Anderson actress, I'll, you know, my stuff will pop up at my website. Um, and it's been, um, quite a journey. It's, it's, uh, met some incredible people and experiences and, but I'm, I'm never one to kind of sit by the phone. So I ventured into writing and, uh, publicity and <clears throat> artist and uh, you know all sorts of 
areas um, to keep creatively busy. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, we wear more than one hat. I'm a, a multi-hyphenate, and I totally believe people should do that. When they say, well, you should just do this or you should do No, don't limit yourself. Go for it, man. You know, yeah, if you've got the energy, why not? Is, go yeah. for it. Yeah, so they can find out this yeah. at marinaanderson.com. Uh, and also, too, mm-hmm. where can they find your, your jewelry, the Flying Goddess Jewelry? Do you have a special website for that? Well, I sell it on Etsy. So if you go to the Etsy website, um, E-T-S-Y dot com, uh, type in the Flying Goddess, you'll eventually see my jewelry. Or my, my personal website is theflyinggoddess.com. And it's, it was inspired from the divorce. Um, I had a company titled The Flying Goddess. And my logo was this half-nude winged goddess. And then through the horrible divorce, which I encountered in my uh, memoir, um, I sat down on my drawing board and I thought this would really make a nice, you know, jewelry, like, you know, a charm or something. So I um, traced the design and I flipped it over and to make the other half of it to make a whole goddess. And I realized, oh, my God, this is, forms a heart. And there was my design. So I truly believe it was divine inspiration. And that became the flying goddess. And it comes with an affirmation. Women are all goddesses. We're born that way. Remembering your inner power gives you wings to fly. And so I've been um, hoping to help empower other women along the way. Um, And, uh, you know, telling them what I went through and hoping that's going to help empower them and encourage them to continue on and, fight the fight and, um, you know, be successful, reinvent yourself and, um, you know, go for the goal, go for the stars, go for the moon. Well, let me ask you this. Now, from your, looking at your pictures of you and David, it looks like there's mm-hmm. a, 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 a rather a significant age difference, right? So now you said that you met him in the 70s when he was on this the set yeah. of Kung Fu. You had to be like a little kid. <laughs> right? Think about it. How old were you? Oh, I bless your heart. Um, <laughs> well, you had to be. There was a bit of an age difference, not humongous. No? Um, okay. It was like 16 year difference. Yeah, okay, that's okay. That's that's. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm guilty of that. So occasionally my my parents were 13 years apart, so I never really thought of that. I mean, I, I, I dated Javni Coleman for years, and that was like 21 year difference. I just never, never paid attention to age chronologically. It's, it, it's the person. It's their right. essence and what they bring you know, forward to the table and compatibility and all that. So, and I've dated um, men younger, 15 years younger to, than me, and it didn't really make that much of a difference. I mean, in the long run, you know, when they want kids and you're like past that point, it's like, well, that could be a game changer. But um, so it's, it's uh, I, you know, I've kept an open mind to, to age. So, so when, when you met him in the 70s, was there any dating or any romance at that time? Oh, no, no, no. Um, no, I, I actually wandered over to a sound stage that I saw with all these candles burning in the background. And um, you, you know how you have that feeling sometimes that you're being watched? Mm. Well, I had one of those feelings and I turned around and there was this man in these shell and robes with, you know, bald head. And, and I realized, oh, my God, that's David Carradine. And uh, uh, being very shy at that point in my life, um, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I, but he invited me back, and I was basically oh like, yeah oh okay yeah fight well that never happened but that was my first encounter with him. Fast forward, I go to audition for a show that he's revamping. It's uh, Kung Fu: The Legend Continues, an extension from the original Kung Fu, and um, I had a car accident like. Uh, was a day and a half prior to my audition, I could barely remember my name because I had a concussion. And I remember sitting in the um, reception area going over my lines, going over my lines, like, oh, my God, I'm like in a panic. And in blows in David, my shoes, you know, three sheets to the wind. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, um, and he looks at me and he goes, you're here to audition, aren't you? And I went, yeah. And but mind you, a little backstory. His wife at the time, Gail, was her boyfriend and my boyfriend in college were roommates together. And um, okay, like the back story here. Over the years, <clears throat> um, uh, my second husband, Michael Anderson Jr., the actor, was working on a project called Boat Wars, and they were supposed to meet with David at the house and everything, and I was supposed to go and never went. And all the time I'm feeling like this, oh, my God, David Carradine, I remember him in the news, and this kind of attraction to this 
person. Okay, fast forward. I'm in this waiting room, and um, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting to go in to audition for your show. And I said, by the way, um, I kind of know Gail through, you know, a college friend and Ed Begley Jr., and he, and he goes, really? And I went, yeah. He goes, okay, I'm going to read with you. And he disappears in the other room, and I'm going, oh, no, oh, my God. And I went into total panic. Well, I blew the audition. It was not good. And the producer who called me in, Michael Sloan, bless his heart, um, he, he understood. They, I, I didn't tell them that I had a car accident, but they could tell, you know, I had a Band-Aid over the stitches over my left eye. And, but I told him later, and he said, oh, he said, well, d- honey, don't worry about it. I, I'll explain to everybody. And We'll keep you in mind. And I'm like, okay, great. Yeah, that's done deal. <laughs> well, when I moved back to Toronto, um, they had me audition for a guest star role on the show. And it was for a director that I had worked with before in another show and the writer producers I had worked with on yet another show. And they said, uh, one of the producers, Larry Lalonde, called me and he said, um, listen, we have a slight problem with your um, – with the, making a decision here. He said, would you wear a wig on the show? I said, yeah, why? He said, well, good, because we'd love to have you guest star on the show. And I went, oh, my God. So um, fast forward on set, Gail is over there, and she's going, Marina, Valley College, oh, my God, mi casa, su casa. So I knew them as friends from that point. They had me back on the show next season, next season yet again. I work with John Kassar. Um, directed me in one of the final episodes in the last season. So I had a reoccurring guest star role on the show, and which was awesome. And I got to know Galen um, all over again and, and David as a new friend, but uh, no romantic thing at all. In fact, I remember telling a girlfriend, thank God I'm not married to this man <laughs> because of all the problems and things. And I was like, oh, geez, I'm like, whoa. Um, and then when they, um, their relationship fell apart, people were pushing us together because I didn't drink alcohol, very much a teetotaler, health nut, and um, they thought I was a good influence on him. And the attraction grew, and uh, then, uh, you know, history was made. So um, that's kind of how it came about. But, but David, on the other hand, was a heavy drinker and, and drugs as well? Uh not drugs. When people say drugs, um, when I uh, knew them during that time, I'm talking about 1992 to uh, the time that I moved in with David was 1995. I never knew him to do any drugs. It was the alcohol. Um, admittedly, he, he he was in the press. He's a quart and a half of vodka a day. Really? Uh, yeah. Production had problems. But, you know, on David's side, you know, they say he was two hours late. Well, because of scheduling and things, he would sit, you know, uh, you know, in his dressing room for two hours, and he thought that was a waste of time. He could be writing his music. And so there's two sides to every story. Um, however, when, when I moved in, um, they wanted to make sure that David would be on set on time, and they, all the producers knew me um, from prior to David, and they knew I was trustworthy and everything. So they actually production hired me as his assistant and to keep an eye on him and I did and uh, things went smoother um there was an incident where um and it was in the press where he nudged a uh, the young actor that played his son on the show um not Chris Potter but uh, he played the younger version of Chris Potter on the show and what happened was it was um David was just filing for his divorce with Gail. He was extremely upset. He sometimes, and this is a complaint, he often nudged a little too hard because he wasn't totally aware of how hard he was pushing or pulling or something. And he nudged the kid a little too hard, and the kid went bumping into a wall. Well, that was a problem because that could easily have been labeled uh, abuse and this and that, and there was a threat of a lawsuit. So I got together with the parents and I explained what happened and they dropped the charges. So Warner Brothers was ever so grateful to me. I could imagine. And I wrote about that in the book because, again, there's two sides to every story. You know, people could see it one way, but there's also an element of, you know, you have to understanding of the other. And uh, same thing with him being known as Glasshopper. 
because of an incident at the Rolling Stones concert, a very similar thing. He pushed a door closed and the glass shattered and he was arrested. And, you know, it's just, um, unfortunately, he kind of did himself in with a lot of things. Um, and I kind of had my hands full when we got together. Um, and I wrote about it all. <laughs> uh, but it's also to help gain understanding of what, what he was all about, not just the bad stuff. It's There's reasons behind things, including incest and including the sexual deviance. And I'm out there with my issues, too. So it's not a one-way street in this book. Um, well, let me ask Dr. a couple Drew questions. Pinsky. Uh, uh, before mm-hmm. we get to Dr. Drew, uh, uh, was he a- an actual mm-hmm. martial artist? Did he know martial arts in real life? He learned it over the years. When he uh, originally was cast in, in the original Kung Fu, he, he was an actor. But he, he was trained by the best, and he continued that on. Um, I mean, he, was, he loved it, and he was really good at it. So he became one. Um, it wasn't like he started off as Bruce Lee. No. Um, David learned it. And uh, like I said, he was really good at it. <laughs> and what about, um, uh, uh, was he a Buddhist? What, what was his faith? <clears throat> he didn't have a particular faith. Um, he kind of called himself um, cosmic. <laughs> um, there was a, a very psychic, pardon me, I have hiccups, um, <laughs> a very psychic side to David. And... Um, very intuitive. He was, um, I introduced him to um, several clairvoyants, Amir Lamazada in um, Toronto, Miria Cook in Toronto as well, um, Michael Bodine, um, uh, of which I wrote about them in the book as well, because when David passed, I, I talked with them and astrologers, Donna Hinnon, Weiss Kelly, um, Sloan Bella, a key person as to insight. So, so David... Um, he pretty much consulted with Michael Boudin over the years, and um, Michael was one of the ones that warned David about to be careful uh, about his habits. And uh, David wasn't, and uh, therefore and he ends up in Thailand. Well, you know? Let me ask you this. Now, yeah. after, after your uh, divorce, he, he wound up with a woman who was a Scientologist. Mm. Was he ever dabbling in Scientology over the years? Uh, David... No, he, he, David was a rebel. He wasn't a joiner of anything, okay. really. Um, he's, a, he's an entertainer. He loved his music. He is extremely talented in anything that he wanted to put his mind to, David could do. He was brilliant. Um, so, n- no. Okay. No. And uh, now I read your... Uh... To my knowledge, I can't, I can't verify after we divorced, separated... But to my knowledge, I don't ever believe that he would be joining any, um, anything near it, like it, no religion, no, because it wasn't David. Okay. Uh, he was um, just a free thinker, <laughs> basically, a uh, total free thinking guy. And what I learned from David on that side is uh, he questioned authority. He would confront authority, and I never did. I was always in this goody two-shoes. And so I stepped outside of my comfort zone, and... I didn't so much become a rebel, but um, a very much of an advocate uh, and um, for animals and things like that. But I put it to a different direction. But, yeah, I, I question authority and, and what's printed and what's not. You know, it's, I learned that from David. So he taught me a, a, a lot of things, uh, which were empowering. And, I'm, it, and it's in the book to help empower other people. Right, and the book is Eye of the Tornado. Now, um, uh, it's David Carradine, The Eye of My Tornado. Right. Now, uh, I read your divorce papers that are available on uh, Smoking Gun, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah <but> isn't that <laughs> wonderful? Yeah, you know, if, to... if my divorce papers yeah, were ever well, on there, forget it. I'd probably have to leave, move to the U.K. and uh, change my accent. But the thing is, uh, <laughs> you, you mentioned in there <clears throat> about the, this issue of <laughs> incest, that he <clears throat> was involved in an incestuous relationship with a younger relative. Uh, what can no, you... I didn't say younger. I said incest with a, I believe it was close family member. I'm almost positive it's a member, member. That, that it was younger in age. Someone younger. Is that incorrect? I never, n- no. It was not younger in age. I didn't say that. Okay. No. It was not in, no. Just close family member. Okay, close family um, member. That document that was supposed to be sealed 
wound up somehow the uh, evidently somebody messed up in the court and wound up in the public file hmm. um, because it was a response to something that um, David wrote. It was very, I felt, uh, character defamation and degrading to any effort that I accomplished for him and his career. It was um, it was really nasty and unnecessary. And I truly believe that David really didn't write that. It was written for him, but he signed the document. So I responded, and I came out with the truth. And um, so they obviously didn't want it to go public, and he, he was granted uh, from the judge to seal those records. Uh, a few weeks later, I get a call from Smoking Gun. What about these papers? And I'm going, what? Well, yeah, sure enough, they ended up in public file, and it went Internet, went worldwide. I, you know, it was just... So um, it's kind of, if you, if you step into a spiritual place with all this, um, certain things are not meant to be hidden. And I believe somebody in a different universe was looking over the situation and going, David, not acceptable. You're not going to get away with this one. And it, and it came out, and therefore I could write about it in my book. Well, I've read a lot of these court motions, and it appears this one, you wrote this yourself? I did. I wrote every word of it myself. Yeah, you could tell. We did yeah. have an editor, um, Claire uh, McKeon, wonderful, lovely lady, and um, a wonderful spirit. And um, uh, so and she had very little as far as um, uh, any corrections or anything. So, no, I, it was, yeah, all mine. And were you represented by an attorney? Uh, the publisher had uh, their attorney to vet the book. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the motion, this this court motion that I saw on the smoking gun. Oh, I had. It was a divorce. It was. Yeah. Uh, we're going through our divorce in court. Right. But so it, yes, I had my divorce attorney. Yes. But it, but it and appears that you wrote that his. yourself. Did you write that yourself? Did I write what myself? The the motion. Well, the attorney has to go over it. I mean, but but those I I wrote it. Right. The, the attorney is not putting the words into my mouth. No, I, I understand that. And now, um, back to the incest issue. Uh, how did that come up in your relationship? How did he bring this up to you? How did you find out about this? Well, I want people to read the book. <laughs> it's all in the book. Um, it's, I, I, um, I go through it with, um, uh, I would say, integrity. Um, they will understand coming from my background, being molested by an uncle, um, as Dr. Drew pointed out, Dr. Drew Pinsky, my counseling with him, the one-hour counseling, is verbatim in the book. It's an entire chapter in the book because it is critical to what attracted me to David, and um, it can apply to other people. Like, why did I end up in this relationship? How could I be attracted to someone with light? It, it answers a lot of questions, and <clears throat> it was like an epiphany for me. So, um, uh, God, I wish I had seen him 20 years prior to David. I would have run, not dove into the relationship had I uh, had that help and gotten healthy with things. So, um, so do, I want do, people do you, to read that because it's really your, important. Do you regret your relationship with David? <clears throat> no, because it was um, obviously some, some lesson that I had to learn. And the brilliant light and love of my life that came out of the whole thing. We didn't have children, but I had my collie, Lulu. Mm. I'm going to go to tears. God, oh, sensitive time in my life here. Um, Lulu was daughter to Lassie 8, and her brother from the same litter was Lassie 9. And she was my rock um, I have severe post-traumatic stress disorder, and I wrote about that in the book, too, because I know a lot of people out there have it, and there's not enough proper help with this um, situation condition. And Lulu was my um, service dog. She was also a certified therapy dog. Um, we went to a lot of organizations and helped out with other animal organizations and things, and um, she was my rock, and I wrote about how she helped me and helped others, and um, that was the most blessed thing that came out of that marriage. And um, so for her alone, no, I will never, ever regret the marriage. And and I learned a lot from David. Um, it wasn't all bad. It was Mr. Toad's wild ride. It was a wild roller coaster. 
we travel the world, um, there was intense love in love. In fact, even after we divorced, David was still wearing a copy of our wedding ring. It was on his hand when he died. It's in the autopsy pictures. So there was still the love there. <clears throat> and um, that's one of the things that I, it still kind of gets to me. Because, um, you know, I still was in love with a man for years after we divorced. It wasn't because I hated him. It was, it was unhealthy relationship why it was necessary to divorce. Yeah, and it, it and, seems like from reading the motion that you did have some what of an amicable relationship because you ran into him at some kind of a premiere or something like that. You had a boyfriend, a date with you. You know, you went up, you talked to him, you were going to introduce him to the date. So it seemed like uh, there was at least some uh, amicability there. It was difficult. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was difficult. And then, unfortunately, when you get people outside of just, say, the two of us influencing in a negative way, and then turning the other person against the other with either lies, I love this word, disingenuous statements, comments, and then causing more friction and um, dislike and uh, adversarial conditions. Mm, that's really unfortunate. And that's what happened. And um, Well, who was doing that? So... I'm not going to say, but there were several people around uh, him. Okay. Uh, people and he worked with, the people he was in relationships with, family members? I'm not going to say. <laughs> um, it was just unfortunate. And um, anyway, you know, moving through that and um, financially, you know, getting basically screwed over in the divorce and. The, the, the house that we had, my mother took the loan out for, a $650,000 loan, so we could have a house to live in, and David was paying for the mortgage because the IRS had a lien. He could not do property. And I put my life savings in for the deposit because we didn't have money. People think I was a gold digger, and I'm laughing at that, going, we moved from Toronto. He had the cash in his pocket, which was like $1,000. Um, you know, Gail, they had a joint account, and that was wiped out. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a joke and we were always, uh, hard up for money. It was always difficult. Let me ask you and this. Why, why did he have so manager. much, why did he have so much tax problems? He didn't, he didn't pay his taxes from Kung Fu. <clears throat> um, he, he left it in the hands of other people and it wasn't properly taken care of. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, it, it, uh, yeah, that was a big problem. Um, Unfortunately, and so we were always, you know, scrambling and trying to meet ends, and and so yeah, so people make these comments. Oh yeah, you wrote the book to make money. No, books very rarely make a lot of money, and I certainly didn't marry him for his money because there was none. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and anything that he got as an actor Ed, during those six years together, I was his manager. I was very instrumental in getting most of it, um, and. I paid for my own bills. He didn't pay for my bills. I mean, people don't understand a lot of elements. And that's in there, too. Again, to help other women going through divorce, how to plan for things, how to, you know, when you're compromising too much and you should be looking out for yourself, um, which a lot of people like me, you know, I was what you do for love, you know. Mm -hmm. It was for the marriage. It, I found um, that I thought he was unjustly uh, served in the industry um, that he was this incredible actor and he deserved his his rightful place with the A-listers again and that was my mission and dang I, you know I accomplished that and um, obviously it, it didn't do it alone David had his talent too but he left everything to me and it was an incredible responsibility and to try and, and work in a marriage and and elements in the marriage, um, it's hard. It's just, it was really hard because he had a self-destruct button. I was constantly doing damage control and it was a challenge. <laughs> well, let me ask you a quick um, question before we go to a commercial break. Re really quick. Uh, the, the series <laughs> Legend Continues, right? I, I don't think I had cable TV at the time. I don't think I was, I was going through a period of my life when I wasn't watching TV. Uh, so I never got into that, even the repeats. I could never quite get into it. But the thing oh. is, yeah, I know. I'm totally missed, and I'm a huge 
David Carradine fan. I've seen everything. You know, it's a really it, good show. I, I'm, well, I'm, I'll make a point now, you know, because you can get everything now on those put lockers and stuff, you know. But yeah. the thing, the thing is, is uh, I never understood. Now, was that the same Kwai Chang from the 1800s when he went during in the same guy? Well, it, it was it, his son. It was, it was the, <laughs> the, the uh, grandson of oh. you know, it's, it's the hereditary kind of next lineage thing. Chris Potter. Um, talented actor uh, played his son in the legend continues so because the legend did continue <laughs> so david carradine was and actually playing the grandson so do, of himself a lot of flashbacks to like the uh, you know, original where he played the young grasshopper and um so it was like a, it was like a fast forward of the original okay yeah i definitely got to check it out because they had a, a, a one of those mm -hmm. um binge marathon things on tv the other day of uh, Kung Fu, and I sat I, I, 18 hours. I sat and I listened to the whole thing. I watched the whole thing. Yeah, Even the yeah. Hey, you love it, man. I was, I was a kid back in those days. But anyway, we've got to take a commercial break. We're here with um, uh, uh, Marina Anderson. Her website is marinaanderson.com. We're talking about the book David Carradine, Eye of the Tornado, and you can find that book at davidcarradinebook.com. And she's going to be out in an indie film coming out uh, shortly, which is a red maple leaf. Uh, we'll be right back after these messages. And now a word from our sponsors. Did you know that 30% of all people on online dating websites and personal ads are either married or in a monogamous relationship? 30%. If you suspect that your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend may be cheating online, go to emailrevealer.com. Uh, at our online infidelity investigation. You give us their email address, and we can trace it back to online personal ads, dating sites, and social networks. We can even expand the investigation and find them uh, cheating on uh, escort service sites uh, or even porn sites if they're registered to porn sites and swinger sites. Uh, so check out emailrevealer.com if you suspect your spouse is cheating, and check out our online infidelity investigation. William Ramsey is a producer here at the Opperman Report, and he's just come out with a new book, Children of the Beast, Alistair Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity. Now, he just sent me a copy of this book. Oh, boy, it's about two inches thick. And there's a chapter on just about everybody in this book uh, that you can imagine, uh, the Beatles and... Uh, <laughs> uh, Jack Parsons... Uh, everybody's in here. It's incredible. Uh, and I definitely recommend this book. There's a, a, a bunch of pictures in here, too, uh, of all these people in uh, different chapters and, and uh, information. Uh, Anton LaVey and people I've never heard of, too. There's a whole bunch in here. JC, JFC Fuller. I don't know who he is. Uh, but, but it's great stuff uh, by our, ho our, our producer here, uh, William Ramsey. So check out Children of the Beast, Alistair Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity. Uh, you can find it on Amazon.com, or you can find it in the Opperman Report uh, .com bookstore. We have an urgent bulletin. Uh, it seems that the group Straw Man is still on the loose. It has been confirmed that Straw Man are, are Canadian, okay, and that. Uh, Authorities are asking people to stay indoors, lock your doors and windows until this group can be dealt with. You could find more information about this group, this group of Canadians, at strawmanmusic.com. You can have your ad played here. <laughs> okay. We're looking for sponsors. Okay, In fact, we desperately need sponsors right now to take this show to the next level. Uh, so you can have your advertise your ad uh, played here red live you know like i'm doing now so artfully or we can even uh, work up a little jingle for you with some music and stuff like that and play it here you have no idea how inexpensive it would be uh, to have your ad played on the opperman report on seven stations uh, live friday night and another seven stations live on saturday night uh, plus replayed every day of the week on different stations and then archived on youtube Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes, and all different kinds of podcasts, uh, Pod This and Podbean, all different kinds of places uh, who 
archive the show for us. Uh, and, and on those archives, uh, your, your ad would play indefinitely, forever. Uh, you also get a little uh, banner on OppermanReport.com. Uh, you get a mention on the air. You get a little interview on the air and all kinds of fun stuff. If you sponsor Opperman Report, we have an opportunity to get this show on a major AMFM station in California. We've been approved. Uh, so if you want to sponsor us into that, uh, so incredibly inexpensive that, that your ad would be heard uh, by a uh, – the, 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 the range covers 5 million people in population – uh, where your ad would be broadcast, and all these other uh, stations would be thrown in for free. Uh, so really uh, affordable prices to sponsor OppermanReport.com. Get a copy of my book, How to Become a Successful Private Investigator. You can get a copy of that book at EmailRevealer.com, or you can get a po- copy of that book now. It's back up on Amazon.com, How to Become a Successful Private Investigator by Ed Opperman. And this book has been updated a little bit from the previous book that we had uh, that was available to our wonderful listeners. <coughs> okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. <coughs> I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. We're here today with Marina Anderson. Uh, her, book, her book is Marina, no, her website is marinaanderson.com. And all this time I've been saying the book wrong. It's David Carradine, Eye of My Tornado. Instead of yeah. I have the tornado, David Carradine. I have my tornado, right? I have yeah. my tornado. Now that makes sense, okay? Now, uh, mm-hmm. so we were talking about your marriage to uh, David Carradine. Now, and in your divorce papers, again, you describe about how uh, deviant he had deviant sexual habits and stuff like that. And he died. Uh, we're the original Fifty Shades of Grey, my dear. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> So now, was it so? Uh, de- and, and I wrote about it in the book because it has everything. That it's all very pertinent information. Um, uh, people say, "Oh, you just you know exploitation." No, there is a reason for that. I mean, <clears throat> uh, sex is very important to David, and um, he had some interesting ways of expressing that. <laughs> so um, I, I laugh now, but uh, unfortunately, that is part of how he uh, he. His, dem- his demise. So, so, so this is something um, more extreme than you had ever tragic. been exposed to before in your life. Pardon? Uh, his his behavior was more extreme than anything you had been exposed to before. Right. So to me, initially, it was a novelty. You know, you're in love with someone. Oh, this is exciting. Oh, this is different. Right. And then uh, fast forward, you realize, oh, wait a minute, this is his, the meat and potatoes of his diet. Oh, now we got a problem. You know, and it was how to... Mm-hmm, Balance that, counter it, um, deal with it. Uh, it. It was it was difficult. But you were with him two years it, before you married him, right? <clears throat> no. No. Uh, no. We're nineteen ninety five to to two thousand one is when we divorced. <clears throat> okay, I, I thought the entire relationship was uh, yeah six years, right? You were married four years. Oh, right? six years, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you were married uh, four we, years. We, we, we're, we were together from 1995 to 2000. The phone is flipping, sorry, okay. to 2001. Okay. So you, you had so been... Like I said, you, you don't know really that in the initial, like I said, it's experimentation. You think it's just like a once in a blue moon kind of a thing. And then once they, you're hooked in the relationship and you feel like there's no escape because you're in love with the person, you want it to work out, oh, this will change. And then you keep making excuses, and you find yourself, you know, a few years into the relationship, realizing that this is not going to change. This is a major problem. Right. So for anybody in that situation, I don't want them to blame themselves, because it's not their fault. You knew before you you know, I don't know. Um, there's many elements to why people stay in abusive relationship. Men who hit women and beat them up and they end up in hospitals, why do they stay? There's very complicated reasons for that fear, one, in certain instances. I mean, you know, it's not a cut and dried thing. And it really bothers me when, when people point their finger and go, well, you knew. Well, you should have known better. Right. Oh, F off. <laughs> but let me ask you this. Now, when he confided in you about the incest, now this incest was continuing, mm. it was going on during your relationship with him? Uh, yes. Okay, and then how did you react to that? You just you just went along with it? It's in my book. I don't want to give it all out. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right, that's okay. 
Uh, what about um, R- Randy Quaid uh, comes up with these kind of wild uh, theories of his own. Uh, has he ever spoken to oh, anything yeah. like that? <laughs> you know, Randy Quaid? No, I, I did not speak with him. But, um, you know, the, the world is a crazy place now. And um, y- y- you can't help but go, well, pff, stranger things have happened. So what he said, I, you know, I just go, well, I, who knows? You know, I'm not to, to discount or discredit his comment, um, I, you know. But, but do, would, like would he have any know. access to information that you don't have? I have no idea what he has access to. Have you never tried to know. contact him? No. Okay. Why would I? I don't know, he's making all these. Uh, <laughs> no, he's, he's the one that, that brought David into yeah. his conversation, so to speak. I no, I no reason to contact. Him. Believe it or not, people actually tried to drag me into his litigation. So that's a whole other story. We can get into it on another day. Uh, but uh, uh, so you find out one day, David Carradine is found dead, hanging in a closet in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, can, can you tell us about that? What, what was your first reaction? Um, well, I, 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 when a, a mutual friend of ours called me and she's screaming on the phone, Dave is dead, Dave is dead. My immediate reaction was, oh, his liver gave out because mm. of the alcohol, because he went back to drinking after we separated. <clears throat> and because during the six years we were together, he stopped drinking, no, no alcohol. So that was my immediate reaction. <clears throat> and then um, went into the internet to verify because I just didn't believe. It. I thought, well, you know how they have hoaxes on the internet. Right. And um, made me a reaction was, no, this is not right. Something is not right. This is just no. By by himself, no. Suicidal, mm, definitely not. Um, uh, no, it just it just didn't fit. The only thing that fit was the basic scenario of the choking element to it, but. When they say autoerotic asphyxiation, that means by oneself, to choke off oneself. And, and I went, no, no, that, no, that doesn't fit. <clears throat> so um, so when, when um, things came out in the press you know, over that period of time, um, uh, <clears throat> I just I felt something was being held back. And that's when I started consulting my... <laughs> astrologer friends and my psychic uh, people and like, you know, okay, give me the scoop on this because something's not right here. And they all concurred. And as I was writing the book, I started putting feelers out and connected with a source and then another source and another source. And even after the first edition was published, um, still I got more stories. I would run into people in parties and they would say, oh, God, yeah, I talked to David like a month before we went to Thailand and blah, 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 blah. So all of that is in the book. So there's various theories of what could have happened to him and why. <clears throat> and, uh, n- n- you know, none of them fit the by himself suicidal situation, no. Well, what so about- in essence, I, I, did feel, I did say in the press, yeah, I felt he was murdered. I, I still feel he was murdered. Uh, and you feel that due to this, the psychic uh, input? What about, I think it was Dr. Cyril Wecht or, or Baden, one of these uh, uh, notor- uh, famous uh, medical examiners uh, reviewed the, the paperwork, am I correct? Um, Michael Baden Michael did. Baden, okay. He did the second autopsy. And what, what was his conclusion? I can't go over exactly what he said, but... Um, asphyxiation but see what causes this asphyxiation is in question see that's not answered was it by the hand of somebody else it would go still go along with the theory of that you know they do it to themselves or blah 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 blah. so there's a technical reason and but there's the theory of what caused that technical reason to happen um, what I wrote about in the book is I got a copy of the autopsy report from Thailand, and there were certain things in there that pointed to, no, this was not accidental. And I wrote about that and the details about that. 
which well, I won't say now because I want people to buy the book. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to buy the yeah, that's, that's, you know, I, I know a lot of I, I really uh, that's so discouraging because so many authors think they're going to the people are going to buy the book if they don't make a connection with the audience. It, it just doesn't work out that way. It, it's really a shame because uh, if people can make a connection with you and really get interested in the story, they would go buy the book. My audience buys books. I've sold 300 books on the Marilyn Monroe case. So I know they buy oh books, my. but they got to yeah, I know, I know, but they got to <laughs> know what the case is about. They got to know what's going on. Uh, so you really, uh, I don't know why your publicist tells you that. I don't know who tells you guys to do that because it just doesn't work. And I, I, I live off the sale of these books too, off my Amazon. Uh, so I want you to sell books. Uh, so, okay. Now, Thank you. Bangkok, yeah. Bangkok says that uh, it was a, they said suicide or they said autoerotic asphyxiation? You, what, in the autopsy report? Yeah, the Bangkok autopsy report. Well, again, it's like, you know, I guess with the Baden report, it, there's technical reasons. Well, the technical reasons do not tell you why that came about. Right. Now, but, and, you suspect and that's where I did my own investigation, talked to people, and came up with information and, um, and wrote about it as it came up. And, and who'd so, you talk, besides the psychics, who'd you talk to over there in Thailand that would know about his last few hours? Um, the last few hours? I wouldn't put it that way, but I talked to the police. I talked with the, uh, the doctor who did the autopsy. I mean, I talked with some key people. Um, it was a very interesting process in itself, um, very weird process, because um, uh, I literally had a, a roll of toilet paper on my um, desk because I went through so much in the boxes of Kleenex and crying. I couldn't yeah. believe that I was doing this, um, just literally just rolling it off the toilet paper and crying and sobbing in the next conversation. Um, it's um, it was just a weird, uh, surreal experience. And I feel uh, the truth has not come out, and I'm hoping it will one day. But the Thailand file is now closed, and that includes the surveillance footage. Have you ever seen the surveillance footage? Nobody has other than Thailand, as far as my knowledge. What was he doing in Thailand? He was doing a film. Now, what about the producers of the film? Did they try and help you and get a hold of the security footage and stuff like that? I n never spoke with him. What about, he must have had a big insurance company, right? He had, he had, had that actor's insurance that you get key man insurance for a film, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, did they? Uh... I have, n I really don't know because I uh, was not married to him at the time. Right. I wasn't part of the production. I didn't do anything with the deal. I had nothing to do with any of it. So um, I did not have, I had certain information, but uh, certain information I, I'm not coming okay. forward with. Because that's that was private. So, um, but for the most part, um, uh, that was all out of my realm. I can only go by some hearsay, and that's you know, I wasn't going to write about necessarily all of that. So, um, <clears throat> but one of the things was, I you know, saw there was a wrongful death lawsuit, and that was in in the press and the media, and um, so that was out there. Um, it was a real oh, unfortunate, isn't even the word, tragic is more like it, of, of the circumstances. And, um, but, um, you know, according to um, some people, David, you know, he, he kind of, well, he, he there was one person, and I, I'll give you this one, he, uh, a mutual friend of ours spoke with David about a couple months before he left, and he said David indicated that, well, if he ever came back, they would get together for coffee or something or other. And so there was a hint of, he questioned whether or not he would ever be coming back alive. And I thought, well, that's kind of a weird thing coming from David. Well, because David was warned. And uh, he didn't pay attention. He was warned by warning. who? Pardon? He was warned by who? Uh, a psychic. Oh, by psychic, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, um, I, I read some of your uh, art, uh, interviews uh, with the mm -hmm. Daily Mail and stuff like that. You're doing your investigative work. <laughs> well, not, not really. <laughs> this is pretty, you know. But, uh, but the thing is, you, you said one of your, your suspicions was is because he normally wore a very expensive watch, and, and that was there was no watch in the, in the figure. But he was wearing his wedding ring, you said. He was wearing a ring. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
actually, I originally thought it was for theft. Right. And then one of the sources um, that I was consulting with said, no, there wasn't anything stolen. And I, and I thought, that's when I thought it was the intentional murders. Well, they didn't steal anything. What was it? A personal vendetta? I mean, like, whoa. And so, yeah, he, he but back to the watch. Yes, he always had a, a Patek Philippe watch or, you know, one of his other expensive ones. He always wore an expensive watch. And there was no watch on him at the time? Uh, not in the photos, no. Uh, but the source uh, didn't say it was stolen, so I went, well, okay. And the source was someone that was there with him in, in Bangkok? No. Psychic. It was just a, a source that had key information okay. about the whole thing. Okay. Now, and yeah. um, all the time you've known David Carradine, has he ever... Uh, uh, made use of uh, the the services of prostitutes. Not during the time that we were together, to my knowledge. <laughs> okay. Um, I David never had, as far as I know, even he, even in his autobiography, I don't think he ever wrote that he ever paid for any um, lady companionship. Um, he didn't need to. <clears throat> there was a charisma about David that was just unreal. Um, uh, no, I do, no, I don't believe he ever did. Okay, so then it would be out of character then for him to go seeking prostitutes there in Thailand, in Bangkok, yeah, in Thailand. I can't, I can't, uh, you know, vouch for him after we separated. Right. <clears throat> I don't know. <clears throat> Maybe he did. Um, I just know from my time backwards, um, I don't think he ever did. Um, Thailand's a different situation, though. Um. Also, the, he did a film, was it Columbia? There was another film where it was suspected that he uh, indulged in one of the houses. But, I, it was, you know, hearsay, rumor kind of a thing. But in Thailand, that's, that's a, kind of a playground for, you know, sexual experimentation and whatever. So it wouldn't surprise me if he did at that point. I, you know, it wouldn't surprise me at all at that point. But that's a, that's an exotic, out of the country sort of thing. If you're talking about the United States and kind of like quote the norm, you know, I'd say no. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, also too, you said that uh, it would be out of his character to engage in this kind of behavior by himself. That he he didn't he wasn't known mm. to be in a in self pleasure uh, as right. part of, right. So right. That, that was totally out of character for him. Right. Yeah. It's, he he uh, wasn't one for a solo flight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But this business of the the self. Uh, Sorry. What are you vacuuming? <laughs> what are we talking? Yeah, but all this, of a sudden they started. I had the windows open to the building. And oh, yeah, started the, with these blowers. The leaf blowers go by. Yeah. The polluting the air. Another pet <laughs> gripe of mine. Polluting the air with these gasoline blowers. Lovely. I anyway. thought you were starting to vacuum your your place over there. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. They're just but, so incredibly But the thing loud. is, because this is a serious topic, I apologize. Because you know, God, God rest his soul, and, and, and I hope he rests in peace, David Carradine. I, I'm a huge fan. And so many millions of people are too, as well. A talented man yeah. died way too young, uh, but uh, in your experience with him, he wasn't into self pleasure. But but he was into this auto erotic, <laughs> not auto erotic, but this business of strangling himself, cutting off his oxygen. Not himself, um, no. to a partner. Oh, well, then this and is for the partner, and the, for the partner to do that to him. That's a different thing. Oh, wait a second. So then he was into the partner strangling him. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I thought the, I understood that from the articles. Not, I read. not to not to himself. Not right. for him to do it to himself. Right. 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 But for a partner to do it. Yes. And it was mutual strangulation at the same time. Um. No. Well, you take turns. It, it's hard to do. Oh, I mean, yeah. it, it, it's but <laughs> give you the education one on one on it. Okay. <laughs> It's not to inflict pain. It's to cut, it's the heightened sexual arousing by cutting off the oxygen. It's supposed to do whatever to give him a heightened sense. And what I found from Dr. Drew, because David was evidently taking opiates and he had in the past, what I found is opiates change the chemistry of the brain to where a normal like level of satisfaction doesn't make it anymore. You have to keep raising the ante. 
and um, you keep raising it and raising it and raising it, depending on their usage of opiates and whatever else. And so um, I, I believe that had an influence on um, David's preferences. And you know, and, you know a- in the past, he did hallucinogenics, he did peyote, and he's very open about that and public about it. So I'm not saying anything out of hand with that either. Um, uh, and, it, you know, the famous Laurel Canyon, you know, wandering through there nude and, <laughs> and getting arrested. And, oh, my God. You know, he, he, ha- he, had, he, he was out there with, with um, experimentation. So, um, yeah, these things happen. <laughs> yeah, so mm-hmm. that, but, but toward yeah. the end there, you know he was using opiates because he had prescription medication or, or you knew from his dealer? How do you know this? Well, we did have the prescription medications around because we had various surgeries between the two of us, and he had dental problems and things. So um, that was always around. I never bothered looking at the bottles to see if anything was used, but there were certain symptoms and behaviors that he had that I asked Dr. Drew about and said, I don't understand. How could he sleep through an alarm, people pounding on the door, or the phone, blah, 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 and... It's like all of a sudden it was like, oh, my God, duh, opiates. Of course that would, oh, geez, like how lame I felt, you know. But if you, you're not educated and you don't know what, what the signs are to look for them and, and to question it, basically. So, um, what so about I, the, I believe that he was on opiates. Constipation. Was he using a lot of laxatives? <clears throat> You don't know? Not that I was aware okay, of. Okay, because, yeah, because people who take, you know, those... those that can, yeah. uh, you know, but um, I just think that's uh, what an off-the-wall question is. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I've, I've, you know, I've done investigations before with people who are drug addicts, <laughs> and that's uh, one of the symptoms of uh, heavy yeah. use of drugs, especially... He a, did like his prunes, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, a, a pill form. Seriously. Okay. All oh right, so God. We're, we're out of time anyway, so that's not a great question to end off on, the laxative question. But there had no, to be it's asked. not. <laughs> it had, we had to get to the bottom. We had to get to the bottom of that. <laughs> no, no pun intended, I'm yeah. sure, right? <laughs> Let's, uh, Marina Anderson, thank you so much. Uh, the book is called uh, David Carradine, Eye of My Hurricane. Uh, Marina no, Anderson. No, it's David Carradine, The Eye of My Tornado. Oh. <laughs> Why is David the eye of my tornado? Because I'm in the center, or he's in the center, and everybody's like swirling around him and scrambling in chaos, and he would like stand there and just be amused by everything. And I thought, ah, oh, the eye of my tornado. Okay, that's the name of the book. I get it now. Uh, David Carradine, yeah. the eye of my tornado, marinaanderson.com, and also uh, davidcarradinebook.com. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Good, good night. Okay, well, there you go. Listen, if you like the show, uh, you can go to uh, oppermanreport.com and uh, check out the members section uh, there where we have a lot of additional content and a lot of uh, additional shows uh, that you can get a hold of there uh, where people are a little bit more uh, interested in talking about the uh, <laughs> the topic. Uh, good night. And now a word from our sponsors. Did you know that 30% of all people on online dating websites and personal ads are either married or in a monogamous relationship? 30%. If you suspect that your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend may be cheating online, go to emailrevealer.com at our online infidelity investigation. You give us their email address, and we can trace it back to online personal ads, dating sites, and social networks. We can even expand the investigation and find them uh, cheating on uh, escort service sites uh, or even porn sites if they're registered to porn sites and swinger sites. Uh, So check out emailrevealer.com if you suspect your spouse is cheating, and check out our online infidelity investigation. William Ramsey is a producer here at the Opperman Report, and he's just come out with a new book, Children of the Beast, Alistair Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity. Now, he just sent me a copy of this book. Oh, boy, it's about two inches thick, and there's a chapter on just about everybody in this book uh, that you can imagine, uh, the Beatles and... uh, (laughs) uh, Jack Parsons... uh, 
everybody's in here. It's incredible. Uh, and I definitely recommend this book. There's a, a, a bunch of pictures in here, too, uh, of all these people in uh, different chapters and, and uh, information. Uh, Anton LaVey and people I've never heard of, too. There's a whole bunch in here. JC, JFC Fuller. I don't know who he is. Uh, but, but it's great stuff uh, by our, ho our, our producer here, uh, William Ramsey. So check out Children of the Beast. Alistair Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity. Uh, you can find it on Amazon.com, or you can find it in the Opperman Report uh, .com bookstore. We have an urgent bulletin. Uh, it seems that the group Straw Man is still on the loose. It has been confirmed that Straw Man are, are Canadian, okay, and that. Uh, Authorities are asking people to stay indoors, lock your doors and windows until this group can be dealt with. You could find more information about this group, this group of Canadians, at strawmanmusic.com. You can have your ad played here. <laughs> okay. We're looking for sponsors. Okay, In fact, we desperately need sponsors right now to take this show to the next level. Uh, so you can have your advertise your ad uh, played here red live you know like i'm doing now so artfully or we can even uh, work up a little jingle for you with some music and stuff like that and play it here you have no idea how inexpensive it would be uh, to have your ad played on the opperman report on seven stations uh, live friday night and another seven stations live on saturday night uh, plus replayed every day of the week on different stations and then archived on youtube Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes, and all different kinds of podcasts, uh, Pod This and Pod Bean, all different kinds of places uh, who archive the show for us. Uh, and, and on those archives, uh, your, your ad would play indefinitely, forever. Uh, you also get a little uh, banner on OppermanReport.com. Uh, you get a mention on the air. You get a little interview on the air and all kinds of fun stuff. If you sponsor Opperman Report. We have an opportunity to get this show on a major AM/FM station in California. We've been approved, uh, so if you want to sponsor us into that, uh, so incredibly inexpensive that that your ad would be heard uh, by a uh, the, the, the the range covers five million people in population, uh, where your ad would be broadcast, and all these other uh, stations would be thrown in for free. Uh, so really uh, affordable prices. To sponsor OppermanReport.com. Get a copy of my book, How to Become a Successful Private Investigator. You can get a copy of that book at EmailRevealer.com, or you can get a copy of that book now, which is back up on Amazon.com. How to Become a Successful Private Investigator by Ed Opperman. And this book has been updated a little bit from the previous book that we had uh, that was available to our wonderful listeners. It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator, Ed Opperman, and this show is brought to you by PSCoco.com. Uh, Phoebe Saad is an independent curator with the Cocoa Exchange, uh, formerly known as Dove Chocolate Discoveries. Everybody knows Dove Chocolate Discoveries. They make the best chocolates out there. Uh, and uh, They make the best chocolate because they start with the best cocoa beans which are tested for quality by expert technicians. The Cocoa Exchange offers not just premium chocolates, but anything from sauces and spices to brownie mixes, cake mixes, and even coffee and martini mixes. So if you wish to treat yourself or someone you love to a sweet and tasty gift, the Cocoa Exchange is the brand for you. You go to PSCocoa.com, that's P-S-C-O-C-O-A.com, 
you click on the shop now button you see all the beautiful chocolates you can order them tonight uh, they'll be at your doorstep monday morning uh, or if you want to get into the cocoa business if you want to be a, a, a chocolate chocolatier like phoebe Saad, you click the contact us button you get into the cocoa business you get your own website and you can get those sampler packets. You can host those parties, like those old Tupperware parties you used to do in the old days. Uh, PSCoco.com. Okay. We got a really something, an icon, really, a, a, a historical icon today. Uh, everyone's heard of Lassie and Benji. And there's even a couple other dogs here that I, I was really shocked to see that they're all by the same trainer. Toto uh, from uh, Wizard of Oz and Old Yeller. These are all the famous dogs you got, except Rin Tin Tin. I don't see him on here, but we got every big major dog, Lassie, all these iconic dogs. And we have with us today Bob Weatherwax. He just wrote a book called uh, Four Feet to Fame, A Hollywood Dog Trainer's Journey. And you can check out his uh, website called WeatherwaxTrainDogs.com. And Bob Weatherwax is the son of, I believe the name was Ru yeah, Rudd Weatherwax. Uh, and, and Bob Weatherwax is the same age as Lassie. They was born the same uh, year as Lassie was born. Fascinating stuff. I can't wait to get into this. So, Bob Weatherwax, are you there? Yes, I am. And actually, Lassie was born one year before me. Oh, you're older than you. Okay. <laughs> when we get, you know, when you get into 70 years, you know, <laughs> you kind of yeah, stop counting. Yeah, yeah they, they go together at that point. Yeah. You know, before we get into Lassie and stuff like that, tell us about Bob Weatherwax. Who is Bob Weatherwax? Well, Bob Weatherwax is a guy that was raised with about 40 dogs. My father uh, furnished, just not last year, those dogs. He furnished uh, dogs in movies and westerns. You'd see dogs in the western street, uh, what we called atmosphere dogs in those days, a and small parts, you know, like actors have small parts. And, and uh, he, he went to work at studios and extra and then was seen by a a uh, a man who trained dogs and was hired to train to train dogs he saw that he had a lot of talent and and uh and that was my father and and he started training these dogs and i grew up with lassie i grew up with 40 dogs matter of fact i helped maintain those 40 dogs and um i woke up one morning first time i remember seeing lassie i was sleeping in bed and his cold nose hit me in the face and it woke me up <laughs> You know, I was checking out your website, uh, weatherwaxtraindogs.com, and uh, that Lassie is a beautiful dog, man. That That is just a gorgeous, gorgeous dog. Uh, now, when you were growing up with Lassie, because I know at, at home his name was Pal, right? Yes, well, the original one, yes. So then what then you the, they all went to Lassie, because needless to say, there were more dogs used during that period of time than one. <clears throat> now, so at home, did you call him Pal, or did you call him Lassie? No, we called him. Uh, the first one my father acquired uh, uh, on a boarding bill. A guy didn't pick his dog up, owed my father $10, told my father to keep the dog in lieu of the 10 And so Lassie was actually purchased for $10, pal rather. And then he, uh, then Lassie showed the opportunity of Lassie came along and dad changed it to, to Lassie because that's the name of the movie. And... Uh, then from then on, during the series, seven, six more movies, uh, a series that went on 17 years, and we uh, we started calling them all lassies. They were laddies when they were in training, and then as soon as they took over for their fathers, they became lassie. Now, can you take any dog and, and train them to do those kind of uh, tricks and stuff like the, that lassie could do? Yes, you can if you have the skill. <laughs> that's the trick that's what the book's about my father and his brothers they came from a working ranch in New Mexico uh, my grandfather trained well he did everything he was a U part time U.S. Marshal he trained horses for Buffalo Bills Wild West Circus and also was a trick rider and he trained uh, a white collie called King to herd uh, about 100 Angora goats and uh, so it was a practical working ranch. And uh, then he he invented the high-altitude carburetor for Curtis Wright. They bought him out. He came to California, and he had nothing he could, you know. He, so he started hanging around the studios and, and doing writing jobs. And, and my, my father started hanging around the studio 
trying to get work as a as a kid as a paper boy and one day he got the job as a paper boy and uh but he had this little dog wiggles that he trained and he was a pretty clever guy my father so he had the little he wrote the little dog right along with him with the paper and, and until he finally found a place with a door open with the people talking and they left the door open and he threw the paper inside the door and sent the dog after it and, and <laughs> And they all looked, and they liked it. And they says, well, you're you're fired. Your day's work's done, but tomorrow we want you back with that little dog. <laughs> and this, this uh, prop man is what they were in those days, saw that and decided to put my father to work at $2 a day training dogs for motion pictures. $50 a day back in those days was a ton of money, right? Yeah, to $2 buy some stuff. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh... If we bought your book, right, uh, uh, Four Feet to Fame, are there tips in there on, on how to train dogs? No, it doesn't tell you that, but it does uh, show you some certain shots we did and how we did them and uh, things like that. No, if, if it's not a training book, but I might consider it. If, it. if this book sells well and people seem to be interested, I might go that way. Uh, I'll have to talk to my publisher. Uh, it's... It's it's very complicated. What we do is we do motion picture training, and uh, I can I've trained all types of dogs, and I have to consider motion picture training uh, the uh, calculus. It's it's it, it's the highest thing you can do. You take a dog into a place. He's never. It's not routine. Most all dogs are trained are routine to do things at certain t- places, and. Uh, these dogs are so trained, you just take him in, and the director starts telling you, I want this shot. He comes down the hill, he goes where he picks up this object. He takes the object to the person, and then he gives it to him, and then he barks at him, and then he leads him up the mountain. And that's what the director told you. There's, and we do it now, because the dog is so highly trained. And you can get that in one take, or you got to do several takes? Oh, yeah, we did one take one day. Uh, last he's up in the mountain. See, when we used more than one trainer, because he had to, because we did... Uh, a lengthy uh, takes without cuts. The day there's a lot of cuts, and lastly, supposedly there's a barn burning. It's a wide shot. You can see the barn and smoke coming out of it, and there's three horses in there. And lastly, he comes up over the hill to the left, and uh, he looks down. He sees it burning. So down the hill he goes. He gets to the barn. There's a rope uh, hanging on the door. You know, kind of we set those things. <laughs> Uh, and so he gets something to get his get his mouth on. He, he pulls the rope and it opens up the door. He goes in and there's also like a um, little two by four is a flip down in between something that that hold everything in place. Well, he goes to the one and he flips it up with his nose and that lets that horse go out. That horse exits, and then he flips up another one and that horse exits. And the horse inside the last one he won't come out. He's stubborn. But he ha- happens to have a hackamore on him, which is a rope type setup. Lassie grabs that uh, and uh, takes him on out the door, and then releases him and goes back up the hill for help. And that's all in one take. Fast, and, and even with the fire and stuff like that, the dog doesn't get spooked. Yeah, it's it's yeah. But as you know, as you know in movies, the fire is not quite yeah. <laughs> what it really is. You yeah. know, there's a lot of smoke and uh, and flame in the background to appear that the place is getting ready to burn down. Did you ever have problems like with the other actors or people working on the set? They'd want to play with the dog and get them all worked up and uh, distracted. No, we we would we would not allow that. Sometimes we wanted it if if it called the scene calls for that type of interaction. But <clears throat> actually, we didn't want that. Last, he stayed by himself in his dressing room, and uh, he wasn't. And he had a hard work schedule too. We didn't want him out there uh, we'd let him rest every every period he could get now do, do you get the sense that lassie knew he was something special yes uh well you know you, you take a dog on a set and everybody pets him we'd let him do that in the morning everybody would pet him and and somebody would might even come up and give him a tidbit only from my father because he didn't let other foods anybody and you know and he got his greeting in the morning and he was pretty happy about that, and then <clears throat> the day worked. And as he worked, he was always rewarded after the scene, and he he, he knew he was going to get a food reward and so on and so forth. When I used to tour with Lassie, because he's pretty, you know, being that popular, 
I would do rodeos. I mean, I did the Cow Palace. I've done the Massachusetts War Garden, Radio City Music Hall, all these venues <clears throat> for people to see him perform a performance, which we, we had a 20-minute act that we did with some of his more spectacular things. And uh, and he really loved that. He got to be a ham on that because, you know, at the end, he'd fight the villain and the people would applaud and all that. And he got so he went off that applause. Hmm. He got up and says, all these people really like me, you know. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how dogs, they, they get real smart. Yeah, they say it's a dog's life, you know. <laughs> it's, it has really yeah, a dog's of it. life. He rode around the limousines. He flew first class. Oh, he stayed in, in the plaza in New York. <laughs> hey, now what about, uh, were you, would you be on the set too when your dad was doing all this training? Uh, I was his assistant. Okay. For 13 years. So then you must That's have been. That's how I learned my, my trade. And plus, I was his assistant when I was six years of age. I used to be the little kid that played Tommy Reddick or, or Timmy that he would train his new lassies on uh, to give a kiss. He put baby food in my face and uh, show the dog to lick it off. And then later on, it became a cue. He didn't need the baby food. Um, and he uh, would have, you know, teach the dog to pick me up by the arm and bring me to him and, 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 and go with him as, as he as, as the kid would have his dog go with him. So I was actually, my say, I started training at about six, seven years of age. Did you ever get jealous of like Timmy the actor? You know the kid who played Timmy, and you know said, "Boy, then you know he gets to be on TV, and I don't." No, he and I got to be great friends. Matter of fact, I did a eulogy. Oh. He uh, he passed too young, and uh, we were very good friends for many years. When did he die? Uh, Nineteen uh, sixty-four. Okay, 65. that's that's quite a yeah, that's quite a long time ago. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it was. Yeah. I oh, even... wait a minute. Excuse me. Excuse me. 1980, 84, when I did the last movie, I forget, 94. 94. I finished the last movie in 94. I've got so many dates. My father died and so on, so all this. Yeah, yeah 94, he passed away. Yeah, I know. The older you get, you know, more people, uh, you know, it's, you know, more people you see that yeah. pass on. It's... Well, I've got a lot of people that passed yeah. away. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was 51. Yeah. Uh, he was about six months uh, younger than me. Oh, that's a shame. Now. Yeah, it was. Were there any, you know, since how, uh, you know Lassie was this big Hollywood celebrity, was there any kind of scandals, like any pregnancies or drug use or anything like that with Lassie? <laughs> <laughs> no, Lassie was pretty clean liver. He, he liked food a lot. <laughs> that was his drug. Now, you got to, at, at that time, Lassie was like the biggest star in movies and TV series. He was like one of the biggest stars in show business, right? Yes, he was. He was a true star. And in the Almanac, uh, the World Almanac, it says La uh, Red Weather actually trained the greatest uh, star dog of all time. Or, it's not dog. It says the greatest star animal of all time. And then I'm in the Almanac with him. And, and he, yeah, he's at the Smithsonian Institute. He's uh, a star on, on the sidewalk in a, in a good spot, not where you buy him today. Okay. <laughs> he's in the cr cross and grumble chain Chinese, I believe. And I believe... His paw prints over there too, because when I was a kid, I went with my father to do the paw print, and um, yeah, he's and needless to say, many many awards, and, and it's too vast to even try to figure. You know. do, do you think um, you, your family, as the owners of Lassie and the trainers of Lassie, got your fair share of all the money ger generated by that uh, franchise? And the money was generated by the franchise, but unfortunately, we didn't get any of it. Yeah. Now, number one, they don't give dog residuals. All these actors get pretty pretty well off on their residuals. Uh, so he wasn't an SAG guy, no residuals. And uh, they felt as if they wanted to pay you somewhat like a dog. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I, I, you know, Lassie grossed, Lassie grossed MGM $48 million in the 40s on seven movies. A lot of money then, a lot of money now. Yeah. Um, he was the fourth highest grocer, and it was, I think, uh, it was Mickey Rooney, uh, Judy... Uh, Garland. Toto, Toto Girl. Yeah, Judy Garland. Uh, <laughs> Judy Garland. Uh, and then uh, I think it was Spencer Tracy, and then it was Lassie was fourth. And, and he had like 50, 50 stars on the contract or more at MGM at that time. And Lassie ended up fourth. 
and uh, Louis, Louis really liked uh, Louis B. Mayer liked Lassie a lot. He treated him with specialty, and and, uh, and so he uh, losing train of thought a little bit here. Better have a cup of another swig of coffee. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was asking, you know, like uh, the rights to Lassie. You know what I mean? Like you would think it would be worth. No, no, no. We own, we own, we uh, bought the name. We acquired the name because when when we left, they owed my father seventeen thousand dollars. Right. Mean, um, and so he, as his accountant, saved up. His accountant says, you know, they're not going to make these movies. Nobody saw any future in anything. And, the, uh, and he says, why don't you just let him keep the seventeen thousand? Keep a little for yourself, running money. Keep, let him keep the majority of it, and see if he can acquire the name. And he didn't think he would, they would do that, but they did, and he acquired the name. And uh, but Lassie didn't do anything for a long time, you know. And uh, then finally the TV came along, and he and he had the name. But Dad made bad deals, you know. He didn't have a lawyer. He didn't, yeah. it wasn't like today. It was, you know, and he actually Lassie was paid. Uh, fifteen hundred dollars an episode, and he signed a thing that said perpetuity. He didn't realize show was, was going to go on twenty years, and and that's perpetuity. No, no, uh, nothing else, you know. No uh, residuals. Well, I'm sure it's still on TV some places today, right? Pardon? Uh, I'm sure it's still on TV in some places today. Oh, right? it is. It yeah. is, but it doesn't matter. We don't get anything. Ugh. That's and a... then we finally uh, sold the name. He and his partner. Who owned the name? Sold the name in 2002, and uh, that was it. And they decided to go in another direction, and uh, they hired a, their own colleague, and so on and so forth. And and uh, that was it. It for last in the weather waxes. But we did, we did tenure it for for 60 years. So uh, I I look at it as it, it's really the weather waxes. We created it. My father created it, and we continued it into a big star. And then they came in and bought it, and it's it's not done well. Mm. Well, if they're using a different collie that's not of the bloodline of Lassie, it's, it's pretty much a, a counter. Yeah, right? it's, it's not the real that's thing. That's not the point. Uh? The point of my book is they don't have a trainer in the caliber. You know, I talked to Steven Spielberg one day. I went up to his office because I was doing Back to the Future, and I went to show him a dog. Hmm. And uh, and he says, uh, Bob, what do I have? Because I have uncles. He says, which one are you? Which one's your father? And I said, Rudd Weatherwax. And he says, your father's a genius. Mm. So I went home and told my father. I met Spielberg today. And uh, and he said, he said you're a genius. He says, oh, don't blow smoke up my... <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't believe me. But he was. He was a genius. And Spielberg said it. And nobody could have said it better. For what he did, his occupation, just nobody could touch him. Nobody could touch him. He taught things beyond... Anybody's imagination. Yeah, I don't I think mean, we. Not, yeah, yeah, uh, Bob. I don't think we see any uh, dogs like Benji and Lassie doing that, that kind of stuff today, do we? Maybe with special effects, but and we don't see. Any, is there a show like right now where they have a dog doing this kind of stuff? No. No, no, they don't. And there's all cuts. Yeah. And it's all. And the dog looks at the trainer, and the mood's not set. Dad used to study acting, so that he could actually get the dog. To respond as the actor, uh, Ann Sweeney, uh, who's the president of, of Nickelodeon, once told me, "says Your father, what he did, other dogs did tricks." She says, "But Lassie acted," and she says, "And he was a better actor than most actors." She says, "So your father taught a dog to act. Dad knew timing. Uh, he would teach me the timing of when to turn his head because that might mean something different. It was in pantomime, and and how to come with his head down because things weren't good." And then how to be happy, how to this, how to that, how to tear it away towards the camera. He was like an actor, actor. Dad taught him the, uh, everything of the actor. He could do everything but talk. Yeah. But, but he, he seemed like he knew English because he always knew that Timmy was down the well, right? And something they, they could kind of... Uh, you know, we never had a well. <laughs> there were other ones. It was mine shaft, right? I don't know who bought a mine shaft, but we never had a well. I don't well. know where that came from. It just sounded good, I guess. <laughs> okay, I always thought, yeah, maybe it's, you know, those are fake memories people have nowadays, you know. Now, uh, what about now, by the time Benji came around and you guys were training Benji, you must have been more savvy with the money and, and uh, the stuff like that. Do you still we, didn't, we didn't train Benji. Oh, you uh, didn't? My father 
had a man that came to work for him named Frank. <laughs> man named Frankie and I have some at my door. Okay, you know what? This is a good time. I'll play a commercial break, okay? This is so quiet in a minute. Uh, my father, uh, Benji, I mean Benji, Frankie went to work for my father when he was a young man. He'd, he'd worked in a sideshow and he taught some dogs uh, a few tricks and things. And then he came to my father and the funny thing there is every day at, at MGM, my father, he was he was a he wasn't a trainer. He was a what you call craft service. He was a laborer, right? And uh, he would switch jobs to get on the Lassie show because I guess they didn't put him on steady shows. And every day, Dad would look at him and he'd be sitting on hanging on his shovel, watching everything Dad did. And he says, "How do you get this show so often? What do you do?" He said, "I trade for it." And he says, well, "What do you want?" He says, "I want to be a dog trainer like you." And my father took him under. Under hand, under arm, and uh, made him his assistant for the Lassie movies, <clears throat> and made him assistant for the beginning of the Lassie TV show, and uh, more or less created the man who created a great dog. But my father was the guy behind that. I remember one day Frank was going to argue with him, and and my father said, "Don't argue with me, Frank." He says, "I taught you everything you know, not everything I know, but everything you know." <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. So no, but so wait. So and it's the truth. My father was above. Believe me, I worked with them all. I've worked with the greatest trainers ever. I've never come up with anybody uh, with my father's talent. Yeah, and it was like he was Frank. And Frank and had a lot of talent. But your dad was a natural at it, though, right? He's just a natural uh, animal person. He's a man that found something that he wanted to do. You might say his niche that he wanted to do better than anybody ever. And did it, and sat and studied, and did it, and did it. When he was still doing the Lassie show, he was still watching the show. So what are you watching now? He says, I see something I don't like, and I'm going to change it in the next episode. Hmm. A certain look Lassie had, or a certain thing that Dad said he could have done this better. And he was continually working to, to his age where he couldn't, training another dog and trying to make it better, always better. So it was a man that was just, he was obsessed. Yeah. You know, like those geniuses <laughs> that, that never stop, you know, until they create something you know, that can't be recreated. Now, you mentioned earlier that uh, you guys also trained, uh, you supplied Toto for the movie The Wizard of Oz, is that right? My Uncle Jack did that. My Uncle Jack was a good trainer, too. Uh, he did that for a man named Carl Spitz. He didn't own the dog, but Carl Spitz... Uh, didn't train little dogs. He was a German Shepherd trainer, <clears throat> and he uh, he got Jack, got a hold of Jack, says, train this little dog for Wizard of Oz, and Jack trained it, and I think it's a masterpiece. When you, when you guys were working on that film, your uncle did he realize it was going to be this iconic film that would last forever? No, he did not. He actually uh, he wanted to do a, a show called The Phantom. It was a cartoon uh, in the in the papers. And he trained two German shepherds in lieu of waiting for them to do that movie. There was always talk they were going to do it, do it. And he wanted to be prepared with a well-trained white shepherd because that's what the Phantom had as his sidekick. And uh, it uh, never happened. But he died not knowing that he had, had probably trained a classic that might outlast Lassie. Hmm. Because that's that's like a stable, that show is. It's... Uh, Every Christmas, it's going to be there, right oh. there. Oh yeah, forget it. Yeah, it's a classic. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just a stable. It's like the Thirty Fourth Street. It's always going to be there. Right, right. Hey, now uh, the other one was um, Old Yeller. Uh, what's the story with Old Yeller? Old Yeller, my Frank Uncle Frank taught, uh, trained Old Yeller, and uh, I think my father worked a little bit on certain shots to help him, but that was Frank's. So you had, so in our family we had Jack with Toto, Frank with the Old Yeller, and my father with the biggest star of them all, Lassie. And Benji but was a guy that understand. You... They trained a lot of other dogs too. They trained. Uh, my father trained Honda with John Wayne. I, I, I trained Big Jake with John Wayne. We just didn't do. This. It became the most famous and our, our most productive. But we trained dogs. My father did Hounds of Basketball. He did Daisy. He did Asta. Um, he uh, 
you know, and I've done the same thing. I've trained a lot of other dogs, like Back to the Future, for instance, and, and stuff like that. Well, you know, I don't really remember so, a dog being in Back to the Future. What, what did the dog do in Back to the Future? He didn't do much. He was uh, he was there at the beginning, and uh, it's too bad because he's my best trained dog. I could have done anything. But yeah. he did do a lot of other work. But in, in Back to the Future, he tested the car. They put him in the car to see. He was a test guinea pig, and, and he was at the beginning when the, when the show started. But he didn't have a major part. Uh, he, I had him in two or three other movies where he had major parts. There were TV movies, and he starred them. What about the? You remember Skippy the Kangaroo? No, not really. No, you don't. Oh, you know, yeah, there was this kangaroo. And I got to tell you, thinking back, because when you're a kid and you watch this, you know, it was a trained kangaroo. You know, in Australia with the game warden down there in Australia. Pretty much, it was an identical to Lassie, but with a kangaroo. You know. And uh, mm-hmm. I know it was a total ripoff, you know. And when you watch it when you're a kid, you thought, "Oh my God, this is the most brilliant kangaroo in the world." But as an adult, when you watch these repeats, you could tell that the kangaroo did one shot, and they just used the clip over and over again. You know, used the same scene. Yeah, well, you see, they didn't do that with Lassie. He did yeah. everything over and over again, yeah. but not the same shot. I we were running out of things to make Lassie do. I mean, our writers would come in. And, and Dad wouldn't let him do anything that was preposterous or demeaning to the dog because they wanted to start doing cutesy stuff. And he says, no, Lassie's regal. Lassie is a hero. I'll do anything you want him to do, but it has to it has to have its integrity. And so but the, the, the dog did everything. He saved everything. Yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine all the animals he saved. Yeah. And people. It, it was one of my favorite shows when I was a kid. Uh, now, what about Rin Tin Tin? Who came first, R- Lassie or Rin Tin Tin? Rin Tin Tin, owned by a man named Lee Duncan. He got that dog from a, from an army. It was a war dog. And what it was was an athletic war dog. It, this dog could jump further than anything. And mainly, what him, that's what got my father hooked on Lassie. He used to go down to, uh, to Nickelodeon's and, and uh, he put Nickel in the Nickelodeon and see these Rin Tin Tin shows. Well, uh-huh. actually, he wanted to. He wanted to. He wanted to. <clears throat> Lassie happened to him while he was making other plans. He wanted to dra- have another Ren Ten Ten because Lee Duncan's dog died. When it died, Lee Duncan couldn't replace it because he didn't train it to begin with. The army did. Oh, <laughs> so, you could- and so that's why you never saw another. Uh, 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 Ren 1010. Uh, see, well, uh, so my father was going to have the next Ren 1010, and he used to critique it and say, I can make it better. I can make it. There was, he felt there was no rapport between the dog. The dog was a stunt guy, and he did leaped and jumped, but didn't have that rapport between the boy. My father used to say, Every dog needs a boy, every boy needs a dog. And, uh, and because you have to have something to come home to, you have to have something to create empathy. And, <clears throat> so uh, he was going to do that. So he's got he has this dog Gazan, and he has a big reputation at MGM for doing all these other movies. And they started the Lassie show with uh, regular collies that they'd got somewhere, and they were using two or three, and they were not working well. And it was a B movie anyway. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so they used. They uh, used, tried to use these three collies, and, and Louis B. Mayer and everybody, they were upset. They said, this is terrible, terrible work. Dogs are looking over here. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. They said, well, what are we going to do? He says, well, we know of a, t- a renowned trainer on this that works for us that does Daisy, does this. Let's call him in and see if he can get a collie. Well, it so happened, that $10 collie that my father had, um, he he had that collie, and uh they said, we want you to do this show. And he says, no. He says, you promised me a German Shepherd show called Rip Goes to War. And he says, I've been preparing to do that show. And they said, well, here's the deal. You do this show or you don't do Rip Goes to War. Oh, boy. <laughs> and so so he did the show. He trained the dog as he went. It became a, a blockbuster movie. And, uh, and Rip went to war. It never happened. <laughs> And neither did the, the, the German Shepherds. It became Red Weatherwax and his famous collie. 
I, I tell you, man, w- what a life, man. Just to drop the name Louis B. Mayer, you know? Uh, just, uh, just what a life, man. I tell you, you, you got to really be look back and be proud. Uh, let me take a little commercial break here, okay? It's about, uh, it's a, I didn't tell you off the air, but it's a four minute and 58 second break. So you got plenty of time to yeah, get a drink of water, take your time. I clear my throat. Clear your throat. Clear throat. <laughs> so we'll be right back with more of uh, Bob Weatherwax. Uh, the book is called Four Feet to Fame A Hollywood Dog Trainer's Journey. And uh, the website is weatherwaxtraindogs.com. We'll be right back with more Bob, Bob <laughs> with more of Bob Weatherwax uh, right after these messages. Would you want to read the book? Did I do good enough to read it? Oh, yeah. And, and now, uh, it's uh, word <coughs> more I got, I got a terrible Did you know life. that thirty percent of all people? They went to a commercial on online dating websites and personal ads are either married or in a monogamous relationship. 30%. If you suspect that your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend may be cheating online, go to emailrevealer.com uh, on our online infidelity investigation. You give us their email address and we can trace it back to online personal ads, dating sites, and social networks. We can even expand the investigation and find them uh, cheating on uh, escort service sites uh, or even porn sites if they're registered to porn sites and swinger sites. Uh, so check out emailrevealer.com if you suspect your spouse is cheating and check out our online infidelity investigation. William Ramsey is a producer here at the Opperman Report and he's just come out with a new book. Children of the Beast, Alistair Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity. Now, he just sent me a copy of this book. Oh, boy, it's about two inches thick. And there's a chapter on just about everybody in this book uh, that you can imagine. Uh, the Beatles. And, uh, <laughs> uh, Jack Parsons. Uh, everybody's in here. It's incredible. Uh, and I definitely recommend this book. There's a, a, a bunch of pictures in here, too, uh, of all these people in uh, different chapters and, and uh, information. Uh, Anton LaVey and people I've never heard of, too. There's a whole bunch in here. JC, JFC Fuller. I don't know who he is. Uh, but, but it's great stuff uh, by our, ho- our, our producer here, uh, William Ramsey. So check out Children of the Beast, Alistair Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity. Uh, you can find it on Amazon.com. Or you could find it in the Opperman Report uh, dot com bookstore. We have an urgent bulletin. Uh, it seems that the group Strawman is still on the loose. It has been confirmed that Strawman are, are Canadian, okay, and that uh, authorities are asking people to stay indoors. Lock your doors and windows until this group can be dealt with. You could find more information about this group, this group of Canadians, at strawmanmusic.com. You can have your ad played here. (laughs) We're looking for sponsors. Okay, In fact, we desperately need sponsors right now to take this show to the next level. Uh, So you can... Have your advertise your ad uh, played here, read live, you know, like I'm doing now, so artfully, or we can even uh, work up a little jingle for you with some music and stuff like that and play it here. You have no idea how inexpensive it would be uh, to have your ad played on the Opperman Report on seven stations uh, live Friday night and another seven stations live on Saturday night, uh, plus replayed every day of the week on different stations, and then archived on YouTube. Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes, and all different kinds of podcasts, uh, Pod This and Pod Bean, all different kinds of places uh, who archive the show for us. Uh, and, and on those archives, uh, your, your ad would play indefinitely, forever. Uh, you also get a little uh, banner on OppermanReport.com. Uh, you get a mention on the air. You get a little interview on the air and all kinds of fun stuff if you sponsor Opperman Report. We have an opportunity to get this show on a major AMFM station in California. We've been approved. Uh, so if you want to sponsor us into that, uh, so incredibly 
and expensive that, that your ad would be heard uh, by a uh, the, the, the range covers 5 million people in population uh, where your ad would be broadcast and all these other uh, stations would be thrown in for free. Uh, so really uh, affordable prices to sponsor OppermanReport.com. Get a copy of my book, How to Become a Successful Private Investigator. You can get a copy of that book at EmailRevealer.com or you can get a copy of that book now. It's back up on Amazon.com. How to Become a Successful Private Investigator by Ed Opperman. And this book has been updated a little bit from the previous book that we had uh, that was available to our wonderful listeners. Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, Private Investigator Ed Opperman, and we're here today with uh, Bob Weatherwax. He's the son of Rudd Weatherwax. These guys are a uh, uh, Hollywood legends behind the scenes you don't you never heard of these guys probably but the, these guys are right there in the back of a uh, uh, wizard of oz and uh, lassie and all this kind of stuff the book is four feet of fame a hollywood dog trainer's journey uh, bob let me ask you a question sure. is, is there anyone carrying on this work you know this legendary work of, of rudd and, and bob weatherwax uh, any no no, no i want to i'm it <laughs> no more so no more do you see anyone out there doing work quality to the, in comparison to what you guys are doing? No. Because uh, somebody has to teach it to them. I learned it by the genius, and 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 there's no geniuses out there teaching it. There's nobody that knows any of this stuff. Oh, they'll get a dog to come in and sit, and they'll do a Frasier. He's on the couch and and stuff like that. But they and, – and they're not going to go to – there's no colleges for it. It's – it's like being in a circus, a trapeze artist or something. You've got to learn it from the other trapeze artist. Uh, you're not going to go find a college course for it. So. Yeah, it's funny you say that because even the circuses are dying out. You know, they just uh, stopped touring uh, one yep. of these big circuses. Yeah. Yep, yep. That was, that was too bad. I remember as a child going there. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a different world, you know. It's a different world. Yes, it is. Well, I actually went there when it was tent. Right. And then, Right. Now, then the, later on, they started putting them inside of venues, of big venues, and I, I didn't care for that. It didn't have that tent smell. <laughs> right, right. So, um, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, are, are there any stories, or really big stories you want to tell us that, that we've left out in the interview so far? Pardon? Uh, I says we only have a few minutes left. Is there any stories you want to tell that we've left out of the interview so far? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end you up with a funny one. Okay, there you go. Okay. Yeah. One day, one day. Uh, well, Dad, when, when we worked inside the set, there was a dressing room for Lassie, so nobody could bother him. But when we were working exterior on the back lot or something, uh, they had, they had. Uh, all Dad had was his car, and he put his car in the shade, rolled the windows halfway down for air, make sure it was cool for the dog, and put the dog in there for his rest. And he didn't want anybody bothering the dog. But lo and behold, people saw the dog. And here they come. They got their hands in the window, and they're trying to pat him, and he can't sleep. And so my father tells Frank, yeah, <laughs> figurative, figuratively, but he took it literally. He says, look, I'm tired of people disturbing that dog. He says, the next dog guy that comes up there uh, and disturbs that dog, he says, kick him in the butt and throw him out of there. <laughs> And so Frank sees this guy come up, he puts his hand in there, pets the dog, Frank he goes up, kicks him in the butt, and throws him out of there. And then the next day, Louis B. Mayer comes down, and he says, uh, Rudd, I want to ask you something. He says, what's that? He says, well, my nephew <laughs> is visiting from New York, and he wanted to see Lassie. And he says when he went to see Lassie, some big fella came up, kicked him in the butt, and threw him out of there. He says, would you happen to know anything about that? Dad says, no, no, I don't know what we, why anybody would do that. And then he, he says, by the way, he says, I'll, I'll personally do a little show for your, for your nephew. He says, uh, tell me, um, how long is he going to be in town? And he says, oh, he leaves uh, Monday. He says, okay, I'll, I'll get to him before that and make sure he's entertained. <laughs> and then he went to Frank and he says, do not be seen till Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
Get out of town. <laughs> Louis B. Mayer is looking yeah, for you. You go, you go hide around those buildings. You do whatever you do, but don't appear anywhere down here. So. Oh, man. Uh, Bob, thank you so much, man. This is this is really a lot of fun. It's a lot more fun than I thought it was going to be. Four Feet to Fame, A Hollywood Dog Trainer's Journey. Uh, I really enjoyed this. Uh, WeatherWaxTrainDogs.com. Uh, good luck with the book. I know the book's not out yet. It's, it's coming out in July, but they can pre-order on Amazon. Uh, so you can go to Amazon.com, or, and I'm going to have the link up on uh, Opera Report Blogspot. It'll be in the Opera Report Bookstore, and you go in there and pre-order. And I'll even repeat the show in, uh, in July so that uh, – uh, Great. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. Good night. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, one more thing. Somebody wants to say goodbye here. Okay. Steve. Steve. Come on. Steve. Don't Roof. move. I'll do it. I'll do it. Roof. 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 <laughs> hey. Steve. Okay. Hey, that sounds just like Lassie. That sounds just like Lassie. Yeah. <laughs> you sound just like him. We just don't have Timmy. Oh, well, I'll be okay. Timmy. Okay. Thank you, brother. Uh, all right. Thank you. Good night. Well, there you had it, man. We finally had Lassie on our show, the, the, the descendant of Lassie. I, I can retire now of my showbiz career in happiness. <laughs> if you like the show, uh, OppermanReport.com uh, in the member section. Okay, guys. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh. Uh, OppermanReport.com. We got the member section there. There's all kinds of stuff in there besides the exclusive shows. We have exclusive shows that you won't hear on the air Friday night. You won't hear it on the air Saturday night. And we just picked up a brand new station called Pulse Talk Radio. They're going to be playing our shows on Fridays and Saturdays. I'm working on another station going to be playing us on on Saturdays, and also too, uh, I'm working on a AM FM stations. We're going to pick up a whole bunch of AM FM stations this summer. It's going to be my project this summer to do this. But there's exclusive shows at OppermanReport.com. You become a member, six bucks a month. You can download all these shows. But also, too, we got videos. There's videos of the the Jeffrey Epstein search warrant execution. It's it's like exclusive stuff. I got the the 24 page letter where Jeffrey Epstein talks about how he created the Clinton Foundation. It was his idea. You won't find that anywhere online. All the Trump litigation with the Trump uh, uh, Trump University lawsuit litigation got all that on there. All kind of Jeffrey Epstein documents. A lot, a lot of great uh, obscure things that you won't find anywhere else available to you in the member section. I'm also working on a little plan where I'm going to do like a monthly uh, email newsletter to just kind of flesh out some of the topics we discuss on here that people don't seem to get what I'm trying to get across to you. Uh, you know, I, I, I have a lot of information I want to get out to the public, but I, sometimes I, I'm prohibited. <laughs> okay, and I'm trying to try to get this information to you the best way I can. So maybe I'll, I'll mention a little bit one week, a little bit the next week, and people don't seem to be catching on and getting what I'm trying to do here. So we're gonna maybe add an email updates here as well and really spell it out to you. So I wind up in prison. Bob Weatherwax, four feet to uh, four feet to fame, a Hollywood dog trainer's journey. That was a lot of fun. His website is uh, weatherwaxtraindogs.com. You can read his bio on there. There's a picture of that beautiful Lassie dog we just heard bark. Woo, woo, woo. Bark right back at you, Lassie. Ed Opperman's in the mine shaft. <laughs> Go get him. Let's go save Ed Opperman. He's in the mine shaft. He, he do- dove into the mine shaft to kill himself. Please go to OppermanReport.com. Become a member. You can send a donation. OppermanReport at gmail.com. We love your donations. They keep us going here. Uh, good night. And now a word from our sponsors. Did you know that 30% of all people on online dating websites and personal ads are either married or in a monogamous relationship? 30%. If you suspect that your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend may be cheating online, go to emailrevealer.com. Uh, on our online infidelity investigation. You give us their email address, and we can trace it back to online personal ads, dating sites, and social networks. We can even expand the investigation and find them uh, cheating on uh, escort service sites uh, or even porn sites if they're registered to porn sites and swinger sites. Uh, So check out emailrevealer.com if you suspect your spouse is cheating, and check out our online infidelity investigation. 
William Ramsey is a producer here at the Opera Man Report, and he's just come out with a new book, Children of the Beast, Alistair Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity. Now, he just sent me a copy of this book. Oh, boy, it's about two inches thick. And there's a chapter on just about everybody in this book uh, that you can imagine. Uh, the Beatles. And, uh, <laughs> uh, Jack Parsons. Uh, everybody's in here. It's incredible. Uh, and I definitely recommend this book. There's a, a, a bunch of pictures in here, too, uh, of all these people in uh, different chapters and, and uh, information. Uh, Anton LaVey and people I've never heard of, too. There's a whole bunch in here. JC, JFC Fuller. I don't know who he is. Uh, but, but it's great stuff uh, by our, ho- our, our producer here, uh, William Ramsey. So check out Children of the Beast, Alistair Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity. Uh, you can find it on Amazon.com. Or you could find it in the Opperman Report uh, dot com bookstore. We have an urgent bulletin. Uh, it seems that the group Straw Man is still on the loose. It has been confirmed that Straw Man are, are Canadian, okay, and that uh, authorities are asking people to stay indoors. Lock your doors and windows until this group can be dealt with. You could find more information about this group, this group of Canadians, at strawmanmusic.com. You can have your ad played here. <laughs> okay. We're looking for sponsors. Okay, In fact, we desperately need sponsors right now to take this show to the next level. Uh, so you can... Have your advertised, your ad uh, played here, read live, you know, like I'm doing now so artfully. Or we can even uh, work up a little jingle for you with some music and stuff like that and play it here. You have no idea how inexpensive it would be uh, to have your ad played on the Opperman Report on seven stations uh, live Friday night and another seven stations live on Saturday night, uh, plus replayed every day of the week on different stations and then archived on YouTube. Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes, and all different kinds of podcasts, uh, Pod This and Pod Bean, all different kinds of places uh, who archive the show for us. Uh, and, and on those archives, uh, your, your ad would play indefinitely, forever. Uh, you also get a little uh, banner on OppermanReport.com. Uh, you get a mention on the air. You get a little interview on the air and all kinds of fun stuff if you sponsor Opperman Report. We have an opportunity to get this show on a major AMFM station in California. We've been approved. Uh, so if you want to sponsor us into that, uh, so incredibly inexpensive that, that your ad would be heard uh, by a uh, – the, 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 the range covers 5 million people in population uh, where your ad would be broadcast and all these other uh, stations would be thrown in for free. Uh, so really uh, affordable prices to sponsor OppermanReport.com. Get a copy of my book, How to Become a Successful Private Investigator. You can get a copy of that book at EmailRevealer.com or you can get a copy of that book now. It's back up on Amazon.com. How to Become a Successful Private Investigator by Ed Opperman. And this book has been updated a little bit from the previous book that we had uh, that was available to our wonderful listeners.